the epistle is from Colossians. Brethren, putting on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, the powers of mercy, benignity, humility, modesty, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if any have a complaint against another. Even as the Lord, even as the Lord hath forgiven you, so you also. But above all these things, have charity, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of Christ rejoice in your heart, wherein you are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you abundantly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual canticles, singing in grace in your hearts to God. All whatsoever you do in word or in work, all things do ye in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Gospel is from St. Matthew. At that time Jesus spoke this parable to the multitudes, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sowed good seed in his field, but while men were asleep, his enemy came and oversowed cockle among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and had brought forth fruit, then appeared also the cockle, and the servants and the, of the good man of the house coming said to him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? Whence then has it cockle? And he said to them, The enemy has done this. And the servants said to him, Wilt thou that we go and gather it up? And he said, No, lest perhaps gathering up the couple, you root up the wheat also together with it. Suffer both to grow until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather up first the couple and bind it into bundles to burn, but the wheat gather ye into my barn. Have a seat. Well, yeah, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you for the first time. You little survivors from uh, Toronto. I guess there is another group somewhere in Toronto, the other side of town. I don't know. We'll have to look at it as well. And I'm Father Francois Chazal, a French priest. And um, most of the time I was a missionary you know, in uh, India. In, uh, in Asia, and I'm uh, uh, not expecting you know this big mess to fall upon us. Nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a great joy to provide whatever I can to um, to all of you. You know, Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Once is this couple coming from? It's coming from the enemy, says our Lord. And uh, we can ask the same question: Are we the ones who sowed? the uh, dissension, the division, you know, one of the big accusations against the resistance that we are sowing division. Well, I didn't sow the April 15th declaration, all those other things. It is none of our doing. That situation has been thrust upon us. But we must respond with great charity in this situation. And that's what St. Paul insists in the episode of today. Now, if this is a fight of the faith, indeed, the fight for the preservation of the faith, nevertheless, we cannot fight without charity. Otherwise, we will lose the fight. We will end up being uh, absorbed by sadness, by uh, you know, resentment, and therefore, we will not fight effectively. Because the goal of this war is to preserve the treasure that we have received. The treasure of the Gospel of our Jesus Christ, nothing else. Because Vatican II is not the Gospel of our Jesus Christ. Last I have seen, the 16 decrees of Vatican II are all loaded with errors. Most of them are boring. Most of them are ambiguous statements. And, uh, you know, a little part of it is totally heretical. And uh, some part of it it may be uh, good, but that's, uh, that's no reason for Vatican II to be any good whatsoever. And uh, I, I dare to say that um, Vatican II as a whole has to be thrown to the fire, just like the new mass, the new code, the new rosary, the new exorcisms that work nothing against the devil, that don't work. Whatever new there is, 
whatever the whatever new reform have sprung from this evil council that has to be thrown to the fire. Why? Because it is not the gospel of our Jesus Christ. That I cannot reach the infinite and everlasting uh, happiness of heaven. I cannot uh, uh, reach the charity of my God by the channel of this council or by any compromise with it. It's not possible. And so that was the motivation of Archie Lefebvre. Archie Lefebvre says, now in this council, what is going to happen to the poor souls, the poor sinners, the people who are stuck in the false religion? If you are telling that the false religions are also great, very rich in content, with great teachings from God, what is going to happen to all these poor people who are stuck in false worship? How are we going to pity these people? And how are we going to come to the rescue of their souls? So the reason why Arjun Lefebvre was such an anti-liberal is because he is a missionary, because he wanted the salvation of souls. And that must be the motive of uh, what we do. And um, not because we are better than the others. Everywhere in the world, you see, uh, the groups of the resistance, they don't look that great. You know, we should not have, uh, you, we should not be highly opinionated people. What I propose to you is simply to recognize that this situation has, has been thrust upon us by the circumstances. Those are, the days are very evil, and we try our best simply to survive, Sim simply to keep the same message, which is a key theme of the Catholic Church, that universal message. They are one message that is uh, for the good of the entire human race. And we do this for the love of those who listen to us afterwards. They may not listen to us now. We may still remain a few for some time. But I'm not uh, altogether sure about this. Because, you know, I just came from Quebec, where there was, you know, 60 people this morning at Mass, 42 communions, so maybe 60 or more people. And they say, we were missing a few families. <laughs> including one family with 19 kids. <laughs> that is as many people as in this room. <laughs> And they say it's increasing, you know, so uh, you know, uh, there is some takeover is taking place over there. It's quite, uh, so God is blessing us with many fruits. I guess you had some few dropouts from this Toronto group who will return to the official SSPX, I'm not sure. So uh, we are a small group here, and there are plenty of small groups, others, but we got so many small groups that the sum total must be quite something. <laughs> but anyways, it's a, it's a great adventure. It's a great adventure for us. And it's an occasion for us to show our love of God, that we are ready to lose anything for His love, including the security of having a Mass every Sunday, or the, the fact of having a school. You know, Father Peter Scott launched a great school here. But this poor Father Peter Scott is the proof that you know, resisting from inside doesn't work. Why? Because he's been put to silence. He zips his mouth. He kept quiet after some time, yes. and uh, as a reward for him being quiet and not standing for the truth openly, he is punished yes. and sent to the baboons of Zimbabwe. Yes. You know? yes. So it's definitely the proof. I think that is one of those proof. If there is need be any, is that you know for them to they get punished for you know uh, not uh, for disagreeing. The mere fact of disagreeing with a new policy. Uh, brings punishment upon you. Because Father Peter Scott complied with the request of Mensingen to be quiet. He complied. So why why does he need to be uh, punished for such a compliance? Now they punish the bad guys like me, you know, I'm not surprised. You no, know, I, I I screamed on the top of my lungs, so it's normal no they try to shoot me down. <laughs> but uh, that's the point. Is that it's, for the love of God, I think it's better to, uh, to say wolf, wolf, or thief, thief, or fire, fire, when the house is burning. It's, uh, it's more charitable to warn the people that uh, you know, the, uh, thing, the situation is not going to be remedied that easily. And um, let's uh, hope and pray that some of these poor priests of the, of the so-called internal resistance we open their eyes to come to your assistance. To your assistance. Because 
uh, there, there won't be uh, a miracle, you know. Like in the 70s, there was no miracle. All those thousands of priests who agreed with Archbishop Lefebvre and hundreds of bishops who told him to persevere, who told him that he was doing the right thing. What happened to them? The worst of them, I think, is Cardinal Siri, but Cardinal Ottaviani is not that far off. Remember the picture of Cardinal Ottaviani when, when Paul VI is going to discard the papal tiara. Look at the face he's doing. Ottaviani does not agree with what is taking place. But he's going to keep silent. He's going to be tormented inside. You know. He's going to be in a state of anguish. But he's not going to do anything. And Cardinal Siri is even worse because he had the opportunity of saving the church because it seems that he was elected by the conclave. But he backed down in the face of threats. And so his cowardice failed to, uh, to uh, save the Catholic Church when the chance was given to it. Because there was a great chance given to it. And that's why you know, we, want to be, uh, you know, we want to call ourselves mirror and core. Because we, we have a problem you know, of a non-fighting spirit. A non-fighting spirit which is not the spirit of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, because our Lord Jesus Christ said, I came here to send the sword. The sword. He's the king of peace. But civis pacem, parabellum. And so there has to be a sword. You must give the sword to, uh, to the dragon. You know, he needs to be fed. He needs to have breakfast, lunch and dinner. Why would put it in his mouth? Is, uh, is the lance of St. Michael. That's what he's going to eat. <laughs> but because this is what he, that's in his nature to eat the sword and to taste the heel of the, uh, and the pressure on the heel of our Blessed Mother. That's all he deserves. We cannot be nice you know, um, with, um, with respect to those, um, those evil uh, creatures. But uh, also, at the same time, we must be uh, meek like a lamb and uh, really um, give assistance to each other, really uh, care for each other, and, um, and uh, provide the best for each other, and uh, support ourselves with uh, our prayers. And so your prayers are very precious, because you are in a state of isolation. We cannot say when we are going to be able to give you, uh, you know, every Sunday Mass. As I come here to say the Mass for you, because I am here and I... I tried to bilocate many times, but never succeeded. So because I'm here, many other centers don't have the Mass on Sunday. It's always a terrible uh, sacrifice we are making. It's tearing us priests from inside. You know, it's, uh, it's breaking our hearts, and it's breaking also your hearts. Because you wish you could have the Mass here today, but not at the expense of many, so many others not having the Mass. We are so overextended. And so that's why we, uh, we, we do anything we can on Sunday. And uh, if we have any days left, then we use those days in order to train priests. So that there is maybe some cavalry uh, you know, along the horizon. So, um, so all this is a, is a great uh, burden of the virtue of charity. And the charity will keep us going. You know, and persevere year after year in the maintenance of that same message, the message that was transmitted to us, to Archbishop Lefebvre, and we need to uphold. This message is, is that the Council of Vatican II is a total perversion of the spirit. It's a wicked council, it's a worst disaster in the history of the Church. And Archbishop Lefebvre would say, you know, we cannot, uh, on ne peut pas s'entendre avec ces, ces, ces gens-là. We cannot get along with these people. These people want to destroy the church. That's what you want. That's what he told Kanye Ratzinger in 1988. You want to destroy the church. I want to, to rebuild. You want to destroy tradition. I want to rebuild. We do not get along. We cannot get along because we want the exact opposite. And this I cannot change. And since I cannot change it, I have to provide. I have to provide. I cannot leave my children orphans. And so he uh, went on and consecrated bishops for that purpose. Because we don't see any change. And, um, and so um, what's, uh, 
what you need to know is that even if no deal is actually signed, the doctrinal deal is signed. There is a new doctrine, which is confirmed by the latest talk of Bishop Philip. Even if he says that he's horrified by Pope Francis, he maintains the, main, the, the same error that you know, Vatican II is, has good things. They, are, we, they have to say that there are good things in Vatican II, saying that this is the position of our Chocolat Faire. No. Our Chocolat Faire said it's an illusion to say that based on, uh, on the fact that there are good phrases, perhaps in Vatican II, that you can reconcile Vatican II. That's an illusion. He said it at the same time. That's a misquote because it's, it's incomplete. It doesn't show the whole thought of Archbishop Lefebvre. We always believed that this council is evil and must be discarded and condemned. So, um, so you know, let us try to do what we can to help those who want still to listen to us. It seems as they are passing by. The curtain now is falling and uh, some people are listening less and less to us. So we have to carry on regardless. Surprisingly, every time we, we think nobody is going to listen to us or no priest is going to join us in that month or this other month, then one or two or three priests join the resistance, like Father Ribas uh, in uh, Spain and Father Ndong in Gabon. Those are the two ones of the month of November. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see that. Um, but still, we are quite... Uh, insignificant and it's a beautiful thing to do because again it, it's an occasion for us to say oh my god I love you about all things I love you I, I love you about all the securities about all the guarantees I could uh, have even of having you in the mass in the sacraments just like our forefathers you know, our recent forefathers 40 years ago what was the state of tradition in Toronto 40 years ago. Was there anything whatsoever here in Toronto? I don't know. I don't know the story of the tradition at the beginnings. And it started, like in the days of Archbishop Lefebvre, it started from zero. I love that story in Archbishop Lefebvre. It was in the Deux Chevaux, a very funny French car. And they went for a hike at the beginning of Econ. At the very beginning, you know, when they had not even started to get in those buildings. And they went up the up the mountain and then the, the car was hurrying and a very strange French car with a very funny noise. You know. And then it was almost starting, but it was first gear, you know, but hardly able to move with the first gear. And Alfred turns back, you know, and says, when I think that the whole future of the church is in this, in this little tin can. <laughs> and that's how it started. He started with even much less than what the resistance has. With even much less. And uh, I, I would say uh, the situation in this time was even more depressing, you know, because he had no idea how it was going to end. Well, you really look like a complete victory of, the, uh, of Lucifer. And, and uh, when, um, when his attempt at, of a seminary in Fribourg failed, because the Fribourg University was rotten, and the, and the, the seminarians were telling him the little, the little nine seminarians that he had, nine or ten or fifteen, I don't know. They were telling him it's hopeless. We cannot, we cannot go to those classes. As he was vesting for the mass, he broke down in tears because it, the situation looked so desperate to him. He says, "What can I do?" You know. A few days later, you know, uh, some person tapped on his shoulder and says, uh, "You know, we are, you know, four Swiss men." And uh, we found, uh, you know, the, a nice place for your seminary, you know, and, and we have the funds and everything is ready for you. But he, uh, it was very tough for him. He, uh, it, it was, you know, starting from zero was very tough. We start kind of from a little more than that. Kind of a little more. So we count roughly 50 priests of the resistance in the world but more or less, more or less than more. Give us a few more months and we'll be actually 50. Because some, some of them we cannot count because they want to uh, say the vacantism, which is not the position of our sugar fair, which leads to further fragmentation, which is not exactly what we care for, 
when we are already just 20 here in Toronto, you know. We don't need to fragment or 22 or 23. You know. So uh, further fragmentation is not necessary. And also, if the great theologians cannot answer this whole dilemma, this whole question themselves, are we smarter than them? I don't think so. So nevertheless, nevertheless, we uh, any one of those who are interested to resist the corruption of doctrine, the corruption of the faith that has been taking place, well, they are most welcome. And I, I hope that we will not give them just the faith, but that uh, we will provide them also the charity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we will, you know, as you know, most of our efforts is to keep the faith in these days, we will not forget that there is a greater virtue, that there is a greater purpose, and this must not be forgotten. And then we must have a great fire, a great generosity in, uh, in uh, providing uh, whatever we can provide for those who are in need. Like you can pray for the little Filipinos. You know, uh, we are faithful in Bohol, the island of Bohol in the Philippines. They were shaken by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. A few weeks later, a super typhoon never heard of in these areas with uh, winds up to 400 gusts, 400 kilometers an hour, with the main winds between 350 kilometers an hour and miles, 200 miles wind, with gusts 250 miles an hour. The whole place, you know, the airport of Takloban, which I used to use, is destroyed, completely destroyed. The city is leveled. It's like, uh, and with the thousands of dead, and then our faithful in this island of Bohol have been affected as well. I don't have yet the details, but you know, pray for them. Pray for them so that uh, they may not uh, lose hope. You know, and they were very frightened when I saw them, you know, because they had the aftershocks. And so they wouldn't dare to sleep in their houses. They were scared for me <laughs> because I was sleeping inside, I didn't care. What I want is uh, the house could crumble. I want a good bed, so I stayed inside. <laughs> but. Uh, but um, and also interesting, uh, an earthquake. It's like the coming of the Holy Ghost. It it doesn't tell you that it's coming when the earth is shaking. Sometimes you can hear a distant and then, and then it shakes. But most of the time, when the earth shakes, it shakes first, and then you hear some noise, and then you can sense the the uh, amazing power of God. That God is all powerful. And all the populations there understand now the power of God. Most of them don't have the explanation. The clergy of the Nusodo tell them let's be nice and re let's restart our Mickey Mouse region all over again. But then they, they got, after that, a vast, massive typhoon. Because th this is the possibly the what the Apocalypse refers as this tribulation which is falling on the entire human race. Because those things are unheard of, and like the, the other cataclysms everywhere else in the world. Uh, in the, in New, uh, not far from here, in a, I don't know if you remember, in Atlantic City, was devastated by a, by a, a typhoon, and then they just rebuilt the boardwalk. As they finished to rebuild it, a, a blaze, massive blaze, destroyed <laughs> a second time. A second time. So God is beginning to show some temper about those sins that have been committed throughout the world. Throughout the world. In the case of the Philippines, it's a rampant homosexuality, a rampant sin against nature, which is getting very big in cities, in the big major cities of the Philippines. So, so there is, uh, you know, there is, but God, what you must understand is, even if God punishes the human race, the charity of God will not have changed. God, God's purpose will still be to love us. And when He punishes us in this world, He means to uh, prevent us from sinning further. He means to uh, instill to us some degree of holy fear. And He means to call us back to His divine mercy. So if He punishes us in this world, it's only to make things better. Because He has got no other option. Because being merciful further to us only uh, uh, enables the wicked sinners to mock his mercy further, to reject his mercy further, 
and therefore his mercy makes things worse, only things worse, and therefore he is obliged to draw the sword of justice for a little while. Because anything here on this earth is done for the dispensation of the charity of God. And so even those things, so when God will punish maybe these areas or whatever, you know, remember that God is a God of charity. That, is, that He really means to, um, to love us and to, to protect us, and especially to protect us from uh, eternal damnation. Just like Our Lady. Our Lady, who, whose messages are not all that uh, funny when she speaks, but she really means to, uh, to keep us alive, to, pe to keep us in, uh, in good condition. Because she, uh, she is herself the mother of mercy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Credo <coughs> in